Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Caston, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. If there is royalty in the food advocacy world, our guest today, Michael Jacobson, would be a king, or at least a duke. As the founder of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, CSPI, he notched up so many wins in protecting consumers for unsafe food that he made advocacy look easy. And now, after more than 40 years helming CSPI, Mike has moved on to a new quest, creating a national food museum. We'd be wrong to bet against his success. Let's have a listen. Our guest today is Michael Jacobson. Michael is a hero to me and many of you, even if you don't know him yet. But I've been following Michael Jacobson's career for, I think, two or three decades. But I want to know how he got started, how he moved from being a slightly wonky, smart MIT graduate student to founding Center for Science and the Public Interest, arguably one of the most important science and food organizations in the world. So, Michael, let me reel you back a little bit. How did you do it? Where did food fit in? Hey, Louisa, thank you for having me. 50 years ago, I never would have believed that I'd be interviewed by the famous Louisa Kasdan on a podcast (laughs) about food. (laughs) Because 50 years ago, so I'll go back. Yeah, (laughs) Um, And there were no podcasts. (laughs) That's right. In 1969, I was finishing up my PhD in molecular biology at MIT. I was studying polio virus. I loved the research. I just loved it. But You'll recall back in 1969, that was in the midst of a lot of anti-war activities, many of which took place at the MIT campus. So all that stuff was going on, and I was stuck in the lab doing basic research. And I thought that it would be interesting, after I got my PhD, to try something different, try something where I could use my scientific background to more directly influence the public or public policies. I just wasn't sure. But through an accident of fate, I happened to meet Ralph Nader. And I asked him about going down to Washington to do something. I didn't know what. And he said, sure, come on down. I'm not going to pay you, but you could be a volunteer. For people who I can't believe I'm saying these words, but it is true, may not know Ralph Nader. Could you just give a quick little Ralph Nader primer? Well, that was back in the days of Nader's Raiders. And Nader started out by 
writing a book called Unsafe at Any Speed, testifying at Congress, and making real progress for the first time on auto safety. He went on to work with other people, the Nader's Raiders, younger people, and wrote books about the Federal Trade Commission, the Interstate Commerce Commission. And he, with the help of some friendly senators, got a raft of laws passed to improve consumer safety. He got the Freedom of Information Act passed to improve transparency in government, made a huge difference. Clearly the most effective consumer activist probably in our nation's history. So I went down to Washington as a volunteer, though I actually had a small fellowship from the Salk Institute in California, where I had been for two years of graduate training. And that gave me a little money where I could afford to share a house with other people and so on. And so I'd come down to Washington, go to Ralph's office, and I go meet with Ralph and another guy. And it turns out the other guy had just finished a book about the Food and Drug Administration, about problems in the FDA. And Ralph said to this other guy, okay, we, here's Jacobson, got a PhD from MIT. What are we going to do with him? And the other guy <laughs> said, the other guy being uh, Jim Turner, James Turner, said, I just finished a book about the Food and Drug Administration. Why don't we have Mike write a book about food additives, something that the Food and Drug Administration regulates? So Ralph said, hey, great idea. And I said, yeah, great, <laughs> but what's a food additive and how do you write a book? And so they said, oh, just go on, go to the library, you'll, you'll figure this out. And so I, I did, and somehow by hook or by crook, I learned about food additives, learned, and everybody was writing a book at his office. And just by osmosis, I figured out how to write a book. I had virtually no coaching from anybody there, either on the research for the book or on the actual writing of a book. And so that was my first professional experience with food. I was a hamburger-eating, fresca-drinking nerd, as you called me. And the book did came I out. Did I say that? <laughs> so the research, I did the research in 1970 and 71, and kind of towards the end of the research, while I was with Nader, I met two other scientists, and we decided to split off and start an organization run by scientists, not lawyers, which was pretty novel back then. And so I left Nader and built a small food project at the new Center for Science in the Public Interest. So I was right, I was working on food, especially food additives. The other guys were working on a bunch of environmental issues, air pollution, toxic chemicals, including asbestos, mercury. So we had three fiefdoms at the new center. And then my book came out, Eater's Digest, came out in 1972. But one of my conclusions from the book... Excuse me, just, it, did you say it's called Eater's Digest? E Eater's like, Digest. Like, like not Reader's, readers Digest, but, I guess. Right, but <laughs> different words. One of my conclusions was that a few food additives posed risks, like sodium nitrate and sodium nitrite, caffeine possibly, and a few others. But in general, food additives seem to be pretty safe, the vast, vast majority. And the real problem with the American diet was nutrition. People were eating far too much sugar, far too much saturated fat, and not enough fiber, not enough fruits and vegetables. And I really switched my focus from food additives to nutrition, though I've continued to follow food additives ever since. But my emphasis has really been on nutrition. And I learned about nutrition by writing a book called Nutrition Scoreboard that came out in 1973 and was wildly popular. And what it did was make nutrition very accessible to the average person. 
I rated the nutritional quality of different foods. I ranked breakfast cereals from oatmeal to Fruit Loops, beverages from orange juice to soda pop. And I rated them on a scale from, I don't remember the exact numbers, but orange juice probably had a score of 55 for a serving. Soda pop had a score of minus 92. And <laughs> people and journalists just loved those scores because it clarified, until then it was talking about junk food and healthy food, but there was no subtlety to it. Potato chips surprisingly came out at roughly zero, maybe a little less than zero, kind of a middling food. So there were surprises. <laughs> I'm happy for about me. that. <laughs> yeah. There were, there were surprises for me and for the public. And then I really jumped into nutrition with a vengeance. And by then I had totally given up plans to return to laboratory research and have stuck with nutrition, largely nutrition ever since. When you look back on CSPI, let's talk about some of the the big highlights where you really changed the way we eat. You became very litigious. As I recall, you were a scientist, but you had picked up some legal reasoning and legal strategies from your time with Ralph Nader. Yeah, absolutely. He really was my coach in this world and all the other people working with him. I think we influenced people and the food supply in several ways. Skipping 50 years ahead almost, I left CSPI. I dropped off. I stepped down as executive director after 40 some years in 2017. And then as a consultant to the organization, I wrote a book on salt called Salt Wars that came out two years ago. And then I dropped off completely. I dropped off the board of directors about a year ago. I want to make clarify that to some of the listeners. Some of the ways we influence people are, one, with public education, getting in the media and doing that with endless press releases, getting to know reporters, issuing studies and then publicizing the studies. And I was on every radio and TV talk show, morning newscasts, NPR, and all that, repeatedly doing that. And I think we influence a lot of people that way for progressive nutritionists. And I collected names. I went to nutrition education conferences, circulated petitions, captured names and addresses, and built up a little list. And we sent a free newsletter. We called it Nutrition Action. We sent it for free to maybe a 1,000 people. And that gradually expanded. And we decided we couldn't afford to do it for free, so we started charging, and we opened up the readership to the general public. That was very popular and reached the general public. And had a lot of nutritionists, but also mostly the general public. And back in 1995, we reached a million paid subscribers, which was just extraordinary. And I remember some journalists said, where do you think you're going to go from here? I thought, maybe we'll hit a million again on the downside. <laughs> and, but uh, Center for Science and the Public Interest still publishes Nutrition Action with Bonnie Liebman, the editor, who's been the editor for over 40 years. So education was one approach. Another approach was I guess more the regulatory and legislative approach, where we would call on the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which regulates most nutrition and food safety. We'd call on them in a formal way through filing petitions to get the FDA to do one thing or another, ban food additives, label food better. We also went to the Department of Agriculture which regulates 20% of the food supply, meat and poultry products. So hot dogs, turkeys, and other meat and poultry products. And it takes forever to get these government agencies to do anything. So frequently we would accompany our requests with 
maybe letters from several members of Congress, a letter from a couple of dozen prominent nutritionists or toxicologists. It takes such patience to get the FDA to do anything. One of the issues on, we got, on which we got relatively speedy results was trans fat. That's the, a kind of fatty acid that promotes heart disease. It promotes heart disease more effectively than saturated fat, which had been a concern for many years. Trans fat came from partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, and it was always thought to be safe. It was used since roughly 1900. Like Crisco? And it's like Crisco. That was the classic initial food. It, it enabled companies to convert liquid vegetable oil into a solid fat. So you end up with Crisco or margarine. And everybody thought it was safe. The FDA did reviews in the mid-1980s and concluded it was safe. There were some hints of a problem, but in general, the evidence indicated it was safe. And then in 1991 or 1992, there were a couple of research studies that found that trans fatty acids increased the bad cholesterol in our blood and decreased the good cholesterol, a double whammy. And one study was published by Dutch scientists, very carefully done. And then that was confirmed by Department of Agriculture scientists in 1993. And with that confirmation, CSPI published the FDA to at least label trans fat on food. We weren't confident that the evidence was solid enough to warrant a ban on partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. So we filed that petition 1994, probably. Mm -hmm. And then we waited and we waited. And it took the Food and Drug Administration until 2016 to ban trans fat. So that was some 20 years. And that was relatively fast compared to other things. Walter Willett at the Harvard School of Public Health estimated that trans fat was killing as many as 100,000 people a year from wow. premature heart attacks and strokes. Just the most clearly one of the most harmful things in the food supply. So all kinds of things were going on. New York City, under Mayor Mike Bloomberg, got trans fat banned from bakeries and restaurants in New York City. And you can imagine the diversity, all the ethnic restaurants, fancy French restaurants that used partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. And they were able to switch to other healthier oils, and every oil was healthier. They made the switch in a year or so. And that further demonstrated to the FDA that it was possible to ban trans fat. Ultimately, the FDA banned trans fat, and studies have shown that provided real health benefits to the public. I have a question. When I first heard about the ban on trans fats or the issue of trans fats, I had never heard of them before. And I speak as someone who grew up on, I, can, I can't believe it's not butter and margarine and Crisco and all the things that were in my household. So you, had, you were banning something that people had never even heard of. How did you manage that education process? Through all kinds of petitions, press conferences, press releases, and then those more official things of trying to get Congress interested, pestering the Food and Drug Administration, getting and especially getting local bans. So New York City was the first, then several suburbs of New York City, uh, Westchester County, New York, Seattle, Philadelphia, and the biggie was California. And those bans were, would affect multi-state companies like McDonald's and Burger King, Wendy's, all those big restaurant chains. And once some of those local jurisdictions required labeling, disclosure of trans fat, the pressure built up from the local level, and those really served as precedents for the Food and Drug Administration 
And there were signals to industry that they can give up trans fat, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, and still survive. And nobody knew the difference. Huge publicity, if you add it up over those 20 years. That became the butt of jokes on some of the late night comedy shows and newspaper articles. But the basic thing was science was on our side. Over those 20 years, research of all kinds built up showing that trans fat was harmful and that it could be replaced in margarines, shortenings, restaurant foods, packaged foods. And the world has gone on. People can't taste the difference. And that was a critical thing. And one other critical thing was the switch couldn't be made overnight because there wasn't enough of the right kinds of oils available. And so the food manufacturers pressured their oil suppliers. The oil suppliers pressured oil processors who who pressured or encouraged farmers to grow the right kinds of soybeans or canola plants. And then that took a few years to build up the supply because we're talking about billions of pounds of vegetable oil each year. There was an enormous supply that had to be satisfied. And the farmers delivered. They got higher prices for certain varieties of their plants, of their crops. And the FDA gave industry several years to make the switch. And then also the Food and Drug Administration finally agreed to labeling trans fat. And the labeling got huge attention. And it was something that was very easy for consumers to focus on. People had become familiar with nutrition labels, but they would see the labels as a blur. All those numbers, what are there, 20, 25 numbers, but they could look at trans fat. They'd see the TV shows, read the newspaper articles, and say, oh, this has trans fat. And companies began labeling their foods zero grams trans fat. And that was a, considered a virtue. So anyhow, that was how the change on trans fat was made, using a combination of initial scientific research, publicity. We did some of our own scientific studies, petitioning government, and ultimately that collectively got change. So trans fat was one of the biggest improvements in the food supply. And we'll be back with Mike Jacobson in a moment to hear more about his vision for a National Food Museum. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. And we are back with Mike Jacobson. Mike, two things. First of all, it sounds like a pretty good playbook that you've just outlined. You start with the scientific studies, you do the education, you do publicity, you work with the companies, you work with the government. And I assume a book that could be employed. You were a terrific ringmaster. 
And myself as a journalist and everybody else I knew could always count on you for a great, highly energetic comment on something that was happening in food and nutrition. So you as a persona, you had uh, you had the marketing skills as well, or the understanding that marketing to the public and getting their attention was important. Yeah, many issues. It was it was pretty easy to get on a TV show and talk about one thing or another thing because you could relate it to brand name foods, and that's something I started with Nutrition Scoreboard. We name brand name foods wherever possible. So instead of saying sugary breakfast cereal, we said Fruit Loops. And with trans fat, what is trans fat? What does it look like? What, nobody knew. What about partially hydrogenated vegetable oil? Nobody knows what that looks like. So for the first press conference back in the early 1990s, we bought a block of partially hydrogenated vegetable oil that was used by the restaurant industry. And it was maybe a, a cubic foot, 12 inches high, 12 inches wide. And it was white, kind of like Crisco, except almost hard as a rock. So we had that at the press conference. And young scientists working with me at the time, Margot Wu-Tan, went at it with a hammer and chisel to show just <laughs> how hard it was. And we likened it to ivory soap, which people know. And you know, that that educated people. And then we can jump 30 years ahead to my idea for a museum. I like the idea of exhibits to turn somewhat abstract or mysterious concepts or products into something people understood. And museums do that very well. So let's talk about the National Food Museum. It is your next incarnation now that you are yes. freed. I, I'm going to use that word advisedly from the responsibilities of Center for Science and the Public Interest. Where did the idea come from? What do you need? What do you see happening? Well, as I said, I grew up in Chicago that has great museums, and we would go to the Museum of Science and Industry every year or so. So I, I was very familiar and really loved museums. In 1979 and 1980, at Center for Science and the Public Interest, we did a couple of things that indicate my appreciation of museums. One is I sent a law student intern around the country to visit science museums, and we wrote a white paper on science museums showing the corporate influences that some of these museums, particularly the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry and a science museum in, in Los Angeles were almost like trade shows for big companies, where the big companies, Kodak, General Motors, International Harvester, sponsored the exhibits and showed their machinery, their equipment. And they were intriguing because normally you don't see that stuff, but they were advertisements. And um, planting those brand names in kids' minds in a favorable way. And I think the report came out as a little shock to the museum world. And another thing we did that year was created the Great American Nutrition Campaign, which consisted of a van filled with little exhibits and costumes to young nutritionists, Bonnie Liebman and Tisha Brewster. And I sent them around the country to appear on TV shows, be interviewed by radio stations, go to senior citizen center centers, public schools, and put on a little show and talk about nutrition. And we had somebody here in Washington, D.C. lining up these interviews. So they traveled all around the country, from D.C. through Minneapolis, uh, down the West Crazy. Coast, across <laughs> the country, and back to D.C., and I did the stretch from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And that was a lot of fun. And that van was essentially a traveling museum exhibit on nutrition. We created a junk food hall of shame, which was <laughs> consisted of picture a museum display case or a large bookcase with glass fronted doors where we put 
little nutrition exhibits. So we deconstructed a sugary breakfast cereal, and it might have been Fruit Loops, not to pick on them in particular. <laughs> Cocoa Puffs. We deconstructed it by showing a beaker with five ounces of flour, another one with five ounces of sugar, because it was essentially 50% sugar, and then a test tube filled with artificial colorings, flavorings, and preservatives. And we had a bunch of these little displays in this display case, on top of which was a golden arch with Ronald McDonald hanging by the neck. <laughs> so where can you where could you display this kind of exhibit? Not many places <laughs> in Washington, D.C. But at the time, Ralph Nader had the Public, Public Citizens Visitor Center, where visitors to Washington could learn about different things going on, the underbelly, the, how Washington works. So he had a little <laughs> office, and we installed the Junk Food Hall of Shame in that office. <laughs> and Ralph and I organized a press conference, and huge attention. The place was filled with reporters, and it got global publicity. And <laughs> the visitors, number of visitors at the visitor center skyrocketed as a result of all that publicity. <laughs> and so that was my first taste of actually creating a little tiny museum. So that was a, another seed for the museum. About a year ago, in the midst of COVID, I was going to museums. Some of them were open. And I thought there is no food museum, plenty of art museums and history museums, but no food museum. The idea gradually began taking shape, and I started talking to people. And one of the first people I talked to was Ralph Nader, who has a museum in Northwest Connecticut, actually his hometown, Winstead, Connecticut, the American Museum of Tort Law, of Common Law, where the exhibits related to legal problems that were solved or attempted to be solved through lawsuits against companies. The museum, it's a pretty simple one, but the exhibits were professionally done. And so he gave me a little encouragement and guidance and put me in touch with some exhibit designers who actually created the museum. So I began getting into the exhibit world, museum, professional museum world, and started developing a plan for the museum, getting ideas for exhibits on everything from the history of the human diet to the place of food in religions, the history the and showing how junk food marketing targets kids. And the heart of the museum will be the effect of food on health and the effect of agriculture on the environment in climate change. And those are really mm -hmm. the big controversial issues. But the museum can get into all kinds of other very significant issues, looking at worker health, farm fields, slaughterhouses, free people. So the museum is taking shape. We have a website that proves the museum exists the foodmuseum.org, very easy to remember, nationalfoodmuseum.org. We have tax exempt status. We have a large advisory committee, including food activists like Marion Nessel, whom you've interviewed, Walter Willett, and Dean Ornish, two prominent nutrition researchers, two former secretaries of agriculture, Alice Waters and Nora Puyon, two prominent now retired restaurateurs. The big thing is raising money. Most museums sure. are started by billionaires. And I'm not a billionaire. And you don't have any friends? Yeah. You don't have any friends no. hanging around or billionaires? I've, I've <laughs> bemoaned the situation with my wife. My parents were I poorly chose parents. They weren't billionaires. <laughs> but we're moving into the fundraising stage. And that uh, besides having the idea for the museum and developing the infrastructure, the big thing is funding. That's the next step. In the meantime, the nationalfoodmuseum.org has some interesting stuff. Some is what the museum is going to be like. 
And one thing I'd like to have at the museum would be a room with a wall-sized video monitor. And the video monitor would show short snippets of TV shows, movies, government reports or government public service announcements, food commercials. We have maybe 50 or 60 of these videos, and some of them are so fascinating and in a way show the the history of food's place in American society. Some of the most interesting ones are food commercials from the 1950s. Aunt Jemima commercials, and we all, and also magazine ads, that are so blatantly racist, but they weren't seen as such at the time. It was just mm. accepted. Fritos with Frito Bandito. Jello had a, a commercial showing these are on the website. Thirty seconds. Some are a little longer. Scenes from uh, Luce, with Luce, skits by Lucille Ball. Charlie Chaplin, that are are an absolute riot. Try not to laugh during those little uh, two or three minute segments. Well, Michael, you have always had that unique combination of making something fun and accessible and very serious at the same time. Thank you. Food is so important. What we're eating now, in many cases, contributes to great health but it also contributes to more than half a million deaths every year just here in the United States. And agriculture has a tremendous effect on climate change and the environment. Agriculture accounts for about 10% of greenhouse gases. The whole food system accounts for probably a third of greenhouse gases. Plus, add in all the air pollution and water pollution, and then toss in the conditions for farm workers and slaughterhouse workers and farm animals that are just horrendous. The museum will get into all of that and show some of the solutions, which are being used in some corners of America, Scandinavia, and elsewhere. So it's a real important issue, but it can be made so interesting for kids and adults. Well, it sure sounds a lot more fun than the Tort Museum, to tell you the truth, especially given that there are no tarts at the Tort Museum. Michael (laughs) Jacobson, thank you so much. We'll stay in touch with you about the museum, what you need, and I will ask everybody to take a look at the website, nationalfoodmuseum.org, and maybe jingle a little cash Michael Jacobson's way. Thank you so much, Michael, for all that you do and all that you will do. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. It's been great fun. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. (laughs) To learn more, visit the nationalfoodmuseum.org website. Fun stuff there already. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss of Soundscape Boston. You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, 
get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.